everyone seems to have an opinion about the ongoing armed and political conflict between the Palestinian militant groups led by Hamas and Israel which began on October 7. At least 1400 Israelis were killed, unarmed civilian hostages and captured Israeli soldiers were taken to the Gaza Strip, including women and children. That day itself, I did what my privilege afforded me. I switched off my social media feeds. For watching these horrors unfold, the pain and anger filled me with a sense of dread. These casualties were not mere numbers, but people and it seemed we were resorting to a tribal demand blood for blood, disproportionate on ordinary residents of Gaza especially the children and the elderly. There's a clear evidentiary basis to the sense of foreboding. For the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, begs Palestinian casualties from conflicts which have historically happened to be at least 6,407 from the year of 2008, whereas the Israeli fatalities number to about 308. This by itself demonstrates there's a clear lack of proportion to this conflict as well as there is a clear historical basis to claims made by Palestinians with respect to human rights abuses. Subsequent Israeli actions have actually proved this to be true. The present Israeli response does not seek to discriminate between ordinary residents in Gaza and Hamas militants. And further, a blockade which has been partially lifted still is a war crime as per definitional frameworks under international humanitarian law. This bloodlust even shocked me. False depravity intersected with bigotry from several online accounts that identify themselves as Indians and believe in Hindu practices. Immediately, there were thinly veiled social media posts, many originating from India, that called for retribution not only against Hamas, but the ordinary residents of Gaza. I'm showing some screenshots from news stories as it is important to document these instances of hate speech. Cheering on violence and reprisal is neither an Indian or Hindu value and I would like to say this clearly as an Indian and as a Hindu. But it does not matter as the social media war drums beat louder and louder and there is a clear partisan divide without any nuance between right and wrong, between good and evil. In this backdrop, what drew considerable personal concern for me was the impact it was going to have on Muslims in India. We are already in fraught times. With rampant and open Islamophobia, at many such instances, I turned to books. Here, earlier in the year, I had intended to read Anthony Lowenstein's book titled The Palestine Laboratory, How Israel Exports the Technology of Occupation Around the World. Due to my interest in digital rights and the use of the Pegasus spyware in India that was used to compromise the phones of journalists and constitutional functionaries, the present conflict and the media landscape provided me a sense of urgency. I finished this book which was published in May 2023 about two days back and today I hope to share the core learnings which provides a warning for many of us in India. Also, if you want to read this book, it is freely available by Versa Books on a link which I have provided which is the publisher and the digital copy is available without charge. As you may have guessed, this video is not a conventional book review and I have broken it into two large parts. The first relates just to the book, the broader theme and the learnings from it. Second part is on Israeli-Indian collaboration and what lessons we should take from the present conflict to avoid similar cycles of violence and civic strife which may also occur here. So first, let me tell you about the theme of the book. The book explores how Israel has developed and sold its military and security products tested on Palestinians to authoritarian regimes as well as democratic allies around the world. This book also examines how social media platforms such as Facebook, Google and Twitter have censored or restricted Palestinian voices and content while enabling Israeli propaganda and surveillance. The book argues that Israel's occupation of Palestine is not only a human rights violation but also a lucrative business model that threatens global democracy and freedom. This book is based on extensive research, interviews and first-hand reporting from various countries where Israel's influence is felt. Here, the author clearly states his political position in the very beginning. He states that Palestine is Israel's workshop, where an occupied nation on its doorstep provides millions of subjugated people as a laboratory for the most precise and successful methods of domination. He further states Israel as the ideal ethno-nationalist model is reliant on being able to commercialize this message. The Palestine Laboratory is a warning that despotism has never been so easily shareable with compact technology. The ethno-nationalist ideas behind it are appealing to millions of people because democratic leaders have failed to deliver. And here he cites a Pew Research Center survey across 34 countries in 2020, which found only 44% of those polled were content with democracy, while 52% were not. Some of the main topics covered by the book are first, Israel's arms, exports and testing grounds where Israel has developed a viable defense sector which is central to its economic survival. 
In fact, an author states that the economy has abandoned oranges for hand grenades and sales are booming with defense exports reaching an all-time high in 2021 with 11 billion US dollars and having risen 55% in two years. Israel's cyber security firms are also soaring with 8.8 .8 billion US dollars raised in 100 days in 2021. In the same year, Israeli cyber companies took in 40% of the world's funding in the sector. Now, how Israel used its occupation of Palestine as a testing ground and a selling point for its military and security products is core to how demonstrates success of these products abroad and exports them. Where in 2022, Israel installed a remote controlled system for crowd control in Hebron, a tool with the ability to fire tear gas, sponge tip bullets, and stun grenades. It was created by the Israeli company Smart Shooter, which claims to have successfully used artificial intelligence while finding targets. And Smart Shooter is a regular presence on the international defense show circuit. Killing or injuring Palestinians should be seen as easy as ordinary pizza. This is a statement which should shock you, but has been made by the Israeli military, which designed an app in 2020 that allowed a commander in the field to send details about a target on an electronic device to troops who would then quickly neutralize the Palestinians. The second big block of this book is Israel's ethno-nationalist alliances, where its long-serving Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said in 2010, referencing the phrase from the Book of Isaiah, that Israel is a proud people with a magnificent country and one which always aspires to serve as light onto the nations. The same phrase, children of the light, was present in a recent tweet before the bombing of hospital in Gaza. While the jury is still out as to who caused the attack on that hospital, at the very least we know hospitals have been bombed by Israel. Now you may be thinking what makes this possible. Here the author says that there is a deep history for Israel where it has promoted itself as the ideal ethno-nationalist state that defends Western civilization against radical Islam and other threats. And this, by its very nature, leads to alliances with countries which espouse similar ethno-nationalist ideologies such as apartheid South Africa, or more recently, Hindu nationalism in India. This leads us to the third big theme of this book on how Israel became a global leader in cyber surveillance and hacking technologies, such as NSO Group's Pegasus spyware, which was used by dozens of governments to target journalists, activists, dissidents, and officials. How Israel's cyber industry was enabled by former intelligence agents, lax regulations, and foreign investments. This month itself, Amnesty released a forensic investigation titled The Predator Files and the report states the Intellexa group of companies was founded in 2018 by the former Israeli officer so-and-so, which sells the Predator spyware. The fourth and final block of this book, which I found really interesting, is the relationship between social media companies and Israel. There are two parts to this. The first are through social media floods, where, for instance, during Operation Pillar of Defense, the Israeli Defense Forces encouraged supporters of Israel were killed to both proudly share when terrorists were killed, while at the same time reminding a global audience that the Jewish state was a victim. It was a form of mass conscription to the cause through the weaponization of social media as noted by this book. This was a war spectacle, and the idea for spending big to make it happen. And here, its funding was at least for 70 officers and 2,000 soldiers to design, process and disseminate official Israeli propaganda and almost every social media platform was flooded with IDF content. The second is how Facebook, Google, Twitter, and the Silicon Valley corporations and platforms have systematically silenced or suppressed Palestinian content and accounts, while allowing Israeli incitement and misinformation. A comprehensive report on the content moderation practices, for instance, of YouTube demonstrates this very clearly. So under this report, a long list of non-violent videos uploaded by Palestinians were allegedly violent and these were basically videos of Israeli soldiers assaulting Palestinians which were deemed inappropriate and revoked. But the author notes that countless videos of Israeli army proudly celebrating its violence are left untouched. For instance, Israeli pro-gun activists have no problems on YouTube nor do huge numbers of IDF videos showing the destruction of Gaza. Now we come to the second part of the video. So what should all of this mean for us in India? India draws from a rich legacy of the post-imperialist movement. This came with itself a historic support towards the Palestinian cause. As expressed even years before independence in 1938 by Mahatma Gandhi, who wrote in the Harijan that the cry for the national home of the Jews was something he opposed, for Palestinian in quotes belongs to the Arabs. A contrasting view seems to be much more popular today, as written by Savarkar even decades before, who stated that if the Zionist dreams are ever realized, if Palestine becomes a Jewish state, it will gladden us almost as much as our Jewish friends. Now, this should be seen in the context of the growing ties between Israel and India, 
which are represented in raw financial terms in terms of military exchange. Between 2015 and 2020, Israel's leading weapons export market was India at 43% of total sales. And in 2020, India was its largest purchaser of weaponry. These ties are so deep that a research paper calls it the bedrock of our strategic partnership with Israel. But it comes with the export of cyber surveillance technologies such as Pegasus or the recent FT report which shows that even after NSO and Pegasus has attained a very high level of public scrutiny in India, including petitions in the Supreme Court which are still pending, India is still looking for vendors abroad and a lot of them seem to be Israeli companies such as the Intellexa Alliance. Again, predictably, these spyware technologies may hurt our democratic processes by it being used on activists, human rights defenders, journalists, opposition politicians and constitutional functionaries. The second big warning we should take away from this book is how the media landscape is shaped and how we consume it. How information floods our timelines and there's relentlessly hate which is directed against minorities in India. This replicates a very organized level of aggressive and often misogynistic content which is made regularly available in drips and floods which comes through on our WhatsApp which is overpowering and creating divisions in Indian society today. And yet at the same point in time, social media companies turn a blind eye and do not enforce their content moderation practices as demonstrated by a recent investigation by the Washington Post on instances of hate speech. This is also because India happens to be their largest market and they want to be in the good books on the government driven by Hindu nationalistic agenda. The final warning offered by this book is with respect to an object of dominion of our attraction towards strong man leadership in which it requires the subjugation of minorities in different regions who do not fit the narrow prescription of what an Indian should be. I believe this can lead to historic fault lines and is already doing so. This may represent itself as forms of imposition of power where people are subjugated and kept within control that gives rise to long-term resentment and the organized court to violence. We should learn from the tragedy and the unfolding cycles of violence in the Middle East and try to prevent them in India as far as possible, as India is the home for people from diverse faiths and backgrounds. I'd like to end with a quote from the book itself. Even if not on the touchstones of morality, we should just consider this from the perspective of a utilitarian analysis. Being Jewish in Israel is far more dangerous than living as a Jew in almost any other place on earth. This lack of safety is not because of Judaism, but because of the political and military posture of the nation. End of quote. Thank you so much for tuning in to Amal Tas Talks. I hope you liked this video and you join me in asking for an immediate ceasefire that helps prevent a further loss of life. Thank you.